Hi, I'm Jude Gold from Guitar Player Magazine. You're watching Guitar Player TV. And you know what? 20 years ago this year, this guitar was all over the radio on what is probably the most successful instrumental guitar album of all time, Surfing with the Alien. This played the theme to the title track. The man who played that theme is Mr. Joe Satriani. We're happy to have him with us right here. Hello. Thanks for having me. Now, how did your vision change as far as the, the musical direction of surfing with the alien as compared to Not of This Earth, the album before it. Oh yeah, real different. Um, and Not of This Earth, I definitely wanted to, you know, it was a bit of a reaction towards what a lot of the other guitar players were doing at the time. Now a lot of players, I mean, we were, all of us in our age group were burdened by just decades of absolutely amazing guitar playing. And then all of a sudden you arrive in the, in the 80s and all this great stuff has been done and there's this feeling like, well, what else can we do? And, and guitar has been built up and deconstructed several times, you know what I mean? And so um, when, the, when the real shredding started, I kind of had a negative reaction to it because I didn't really think it was uh, as artistically dynamic, let's say, as the different styles that had preceded it for years and years. So, you know, coming up with a song that started like this to me was a great way to subvert the idea to have no drum fills you know to have two bass notes and and to have these weird guitar tones that were you know notch filtered and recorded through teeny amps and using old expensive mics and just we did everything the way rock bands never did it and uh, my cohort was really you know besides Jeff was John Kunaberti, who was our the Squares live sound engineer. He had also recorded the Squares demos. And by the time we got to do this, we were like, yeah, let's just like do everything that our clients, uh, you know, never let us do. You know, when we're hired to be session players or something like that. You know, and so we just did everything the opposite way. We would use the talkback mic to record a solo, just because it was wrong. <laughs> and and uh, we recorded everything in the opposite direction. I recorded Not of This Earth, I mean, just to show you, I mean, I don't want to, you know, make it seem like I was this, uh, you know, genius, you know, I had this all figured out. And, and my naivete was pretty stunning, actually, when we had, we were doing uh, uh, the song uh, Rubina for Not of This Earth, and uh, we had been recording um, in stereo a live performance of Jeff, John, and myself playing percussion. And it was recorded with effects, too, on two channels. And we started the track, and John went right out into the studio. I think it was in Studio D at the High Street building. And we had a table with all this percussion on it. And we decided that each of us would stand at a spot at the table, pick something up, play it for about eight bars, put it down, and walk around to the other side of the table. And so the three of us were, were moving around to create some sort of strange, random percussion track. Because the drum pattern was really a two-bar pattern from an Oberheim drum machine. So I was really pleased with the way it turned out. I thought, this is so different. No one would have done it like that, you know. And uh, a friend of ours came in and he's listening to it and he's going, that's really great. He goes, so you guys put time code on here and, and then you'll replace some of the stuff later, you know. And I just kind of went, oh yeah, 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 you know. And he left the room and I went up to John and I said, what's time code? What's he talking about? And uh, John, of course, knew all about it. I guess he thought it was a great idea not to have the damn time code you know, on the tape because you know it, it would eat up a track and then you couldn't put anything next to it because it would bleed into it right but I didn't even know what time code was and then I, I sat there and I thought oh my god I've recorded a record and I could have had time code which would mean we could have synced things up to it later I mean so uh, as I said I, there were some things I just didn't know what I was doing we were just sort of improvising you know how did you uh, like compose and arrange all these songs ahead of time you know, some of them have very elaborate background parts that move around a lot. Did you sketch them out on a four track or? Mm. Some of them were like that. Um, a song by song. Uh, I mean, a song like Surfing was very straight ahead. And, uh, w you know, we, we had a very tight schedule. We would go in and I, I'd have a guitar um, uh, like that one there, the black one there. It's a Boogie Bodies hard rock maple with a universal route in here. Um, these are some newer Fender Lace pickups that were put in maybe 10 years ago. But it basically had, I think, some sort of an ESP Fender type pickguard. And I had another pickguard that was made by Leo Knapp. Um, 
that had, uh, I think, two Seymour Duncan pickups in it, humbuckers. And if I had a Strat part to do, I'd use this guitar. And then if the next part was crunchy, uh, John would take a break. I would take this part, pick art out. I'd put the other one in, and then I'd get the humbucking sound, and then we'd, you know, do the track with that. You know, Bongo Bob had... I, I think the way I did is I brought my little DX over to Bongo's place, which actually was only a few blocks around the corner here. Um, and uh, he, he programmed, programmed everything into his, uh, his emulator, SP-12. And then he came to the studio one day and laid all the guide tracks down. So I would track against that, um, you know, bit by bit. And we, some songs were very clear cut. And then others, we weren't really quite sure each time that we would, uh, we would start to build up on it, what we would wind up with. For instance, um, I'm thinking about, um, you know, when I started playing this for John, I had some delay on it, probably like that kind of thing. And John was thinking, we can't have these, you know, arpeggios and all this delay and everything, so let's get the driest, cleanest tone. And so I think I used that black guitar there with the uh, with the Strati setup in there, and uh, laid down just totally dry. Probably, I'm guessing straight into a GML mic pre or something like that, and direct to tape bypass the console. And we would start with stuff that was as dry as possible, and then we would see where we could introduce distortion, delay, reverb, and you know we might save a certain kind of reverb just for a shaker or something that we had in mind. Um, or for a song like Circles, we knew that we wanted some sort of dream sequence, but we didn't know until we got a hold of unusual um, samples exactly what we were going to be able to achieve. And then uh, somewhere along the line, like we, we got this um, Songbird cyclosonic, uh, this auto panner. And, and you know, we would spend hours in the studio creating these wacky three dimensional things that would then have this big effect on how much uh, delay or reverb would be on the guitar. And um, so there was a lot of trial and error that way. We didn't, you know, we didn't go in thinking uh, everything's going to be exactly as we planned it out. Even though I had a four track sitting there and I'd play it, you know, we'd have to improvise to see what happened once the frequencies actually uh, were, were, you know, the envelopes were opened up and we heard the whole thing on big speakers. I'm Melody on Surf, and maybe you could uh, tell us about this Kramer here, okay, let me unplug this for a second. <clears throat> and this holy tremolo right here, the, the chosen trim. The chosen trim. <laughs> all right. First of all, I, bu I bought this, uh, this Kramer Pacer at a Guitar Center Midnight Madness sale while I was still in the squares. And um, it had um, an original Floyd that didn't have the fine tuners on it. And of course, I, you know, the Squares uh, was the kind of band where you couldn't really be flashy with the guitar kind of stuff. It was more like wall of sound kind of thing. I was playing through 200 watt Marshall half stacks with, um, with a minimal amount of uh, distortion and, and a bunch of delays. And it was, it was not about soloing, certainly not about the bar. I think I used it on one song on, on the very last demo that we did and it really stuck out as being out of place. But I did really like it and you know, I started um, playing guitar on a Hagstrom 3. So um, I'm going the wrong way on this thing here. So my earliest days of playing was with a bar. So I, I always, every time I got back to the bar, I kind of liked it. And the Floyd Rose was amazing. The guitar itself though, I mean, as you can tell, is, uh, is not a very good guitar, <laughs> you know? I mean, for the money, yeah, for the money it was a great guitar. And Kramer, you know, hit upon something that was great. They jumped upon this, thing that our generation finally said, you know what, we want humbucking pickups, but we want a 25 and a half inch scale length, you know, give us that, you know, so, and, uh, so, and with uh, the widely popular Van Halen, you know, sort of being the, the guy who popularized it really for everyone, it was sort of legitimized it, you know, but this guitar, you know, in the studio, it was the only one I had, first of all, with a bar on it, so that's why it's all over the record. Uh, when I tried to take it out subsequently on tours, of course, it was, it always went out of tune every like five seconds. Um, no, th these things kept falling out. I mean, it was just, it was a, it was a nightmare, you know. Um, by the time I was recording those records, though, the fine, I had switched it out for the more updated one. Um, the neck is, you know, the body here is cracked. The neck plate is warped. 
um, I could sit here and just for you, and that's what I used to do every day, you know, in the studio. Would just give it a little chiropractic. <laughs> yeah. the, the main uh, idiosyncrasy about this is that the guitar's bar doesn't boing. As you can tell, the boing doesn't last very long if there is one. For other things, you know, it doesn't have. It's not a very big sounding guitar, and um, it's not. It doesn't have the longest sustain that you'd want, you know. But it has this bar that is so dead that allows you to do that and it sounds less comical than let's say a more modern setup but we we tried i mean for for years and years uh uh gary brower god bless him tried every spring every kind of block every size and length of spring every number of spring we even tried to copy the color and those springs i think i just found in a drawer at Second Hand Guitars, you know, that was filled with springs. I just randomly said, you know, can I grab two of these, you know? <laughs> and, and it just sort of arrived here. I mean, it doesn't stay in tune very well, but um, uh, it, it, just did, it just did that thing. It's really weird.